one of the themes that we've had so far this year after years of tech stocks outperforming, uh, we went through a period where smoke stocks, value stocks have outperformed. And last month, you know, I kind of gave the opinion that uh, that eventually the, the growth stocks and the NASDAQ stocks would uh, reassert themselves. Companies that are strong growers of earnings, you know, I also mentioned the Starbucks of the world would probably outperform. And uh, Tony, during the presentation, kind of came in at that point, and uh, we'll let him speak there at the end. He said that April was always a very good month for tech stocks, and he had every intention of starting the month of April along the uh, market. And if you remember at the beginning when I sold, showed the charts that tech stocks starting around the end of March have began finally to keep start keeping pace with the rest of the market. So whether it'll go from keeping pace to outperformance, we shall see, but that's certainly been my bias. Uh, however, uh, you know, we, you know, the, the, the ARC stocks, the Kathy Wood stocks, the real high flyer super PE stocks, they are continuing to struggle. You can see it here at this table. The top one is the major, the gigantic ARC fund, the ARC Innovation Fund. So it's up over the last month, but not nearly as much as the general market. Um, you know, uh, so 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 basically, we we you have that trend. If you're trying to remember what advice, why we always talk about Kathy uh, Woods is. She's very good at investing in these high flying companies. So, you know, and the right way to do it is either if you want an exposure to these companies, you can look through the list and choose the ones you like the most on your own, or you can just allocate a small amount of money to her. And then you have exposure to some of these high flyers because she's certainly confident of what she does. Okay. Um, and then also on the Kathy note, notes, I'll just reiterating this pre presentation, we're not talking at all about the banks, but of course, for most of this year on all the seminars, we've been saying that we like the banks and recommending the banking ETFs and they've been big outperformers. And among the Kathy Wood stocks, of course, she likes PayPal. And, and one of the things we pointed out last time, we'll point out again, is that PayPal is very complementary to owning the banks because one of the things, and that was pointed out by Jamie Dimon in his annual letter, is how these fintech firms were, were taking more and more business away from the banks. And of course, PayPal is one of the firms taking business away from the banks. So if you own PayPal and the banks, you're sort of hedging yourself. You own both the disruptor and the disruptee. Okay, now we're gonna go on to semiconductors, which we've talked about for the last couple of months. It's a popular topic because of the shortage of semiconductors. And we're gonna put three ETFs here. And just to remind you that for a big industry like semiconductors, you have three large ETFs you can choose from, which is not unusual. So how do you choose which one's the best? Well, you know, since the, uh, iShares people are here, you know, were kind enough to join our presentation. We will just say that the iShares one is one you should definitely look at. But the way you kind of choose your stocks is what is the index they're matching. So you could see the iShares one is very much a U.S. Uh, list of U.S. companies. So Intel and Texas Instruments are at the top of the list as the holdings. That's probably not been the best thing, you know, for the, for a while, but sometimes it is a good thing, right? Uh, the uh, Van Eck is a very much a global one, so it owns the international names, and in fact, a Taiwanese one, you know, it's market weight, and the Taiwanese one is 15% of its holdings. So that's, you know, a different thing if you want to be very international and you want the big, you know, big holdings and the big names, you know, that's that's what you want. And then finally, the spider one, uh, you know, the, the it is that they basically weight the different stock, the different stocks in the ETF by the same weight. 
So if you give each one the same weight, by, by definition, you're now overweighting the smaller uh, semiconductor makers. So if you want to be overweight, the smaller semiconductor weight uh, makers, that's the one you want to go for. Now we'll just talk a little bit. Here's a slide. We're, we're go, got, we're, we're, I'm trying to keep this moving, but just basically to say that the shortage in semiconductors is apt to continue for the rest of the year. This is thing, This is not going away. Uh, so the question is whether the shortage is entire, that the fact that it's not going away is already in the price. Um, you know, my bias is that it's not, but, you know, you, it's something that if you kind of, you certainly can make up your own mind on that. The second thing, and this has to do with when I was describing the ETFs, is obviously Intel has been struggling, right? And this is a very good chart uh, that kind of gives you the idea that AMD has been able to take away market share from Intel. You can just see it there. There's a picture of AMD CEO, uh, you know, that uh, if any of you guys have a young daughter at home or granddaughter, you should show them, show them that picture and you can say you see an Asian woman can become a CEO of a major U.S. company, right? Uh, but keeping going is that Intel, so because Intel was underperforming AMD and Intel and AMD does not make its own chips, it has TSMC make the chips. There was some thought since Intel has, you know, should stuck to go to the same model and just focus on designing chips and not focus on making chips. So they surprised the world when they announced, no, they're going the other direction. They're got to build two new fab plants in Arizona for $20 billion. So is that a good thing? Well, if you look at AMC compared to the other foundry companies, which it's fallen behind, you can see it trades, it looks very cheap, it trades uh, at a big discount. But you can see that the discount is justified because it hasn't been able to grow. So maybe, you know, that, so that's sort of inconclusive. But also, if you look at the reason that they're comfortable staying in the foundry business, building these new plants, is because they're pretty much being guaranteed business by the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of Defense. And if you look at Intel and you compare it to U.S. defense contractors, it looks pretty darn attractive. So if the model is that Aaron, Intel has some guaranteed business for that foundry business, it doesn't look that bad. So when we were showing those ETFs, I mean, that's a reason to start thinking that if you're going into the, uh, if, you're, if you want semicon exposure, you might go for the SOX ETF. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about Intel is that it, ha it is actually one of the leaders trying to come up with autonomous driving. It owns Mobileye. So it took over Mobileye for $15 billion in 2017. Mobileye is truly a leader in having things on cars. If you think, don't think you've heard of Mobileye, when you're backing up your vehicle and you're getting close to another vehicle and it makes some noise, you know, it's warning you, that's Mobileye in your car. So it, it, it's also just like Tesla, it has installed sensors and cameras on cars already and it's trying to develop autonomous driving. Um, so that's a sort of something that could be a good kicker for Intel. And then on the downside, if you wanna think of it, is Intel really has, is competing with some big guys who are really gonna spend a lot of money. So Intel's gonna spend 20 billion, which is definitely a lot of money. Samsung saying 116 billion over 10 years. And TSMC, if you can believe it, are saying they're going to spend $100 billion over three years on CapEx. So Intel's really got to have, you know, uh, I, I kind of gave the positive bit on the negative bit. It really is in for some competition. And so another subject then would be if all these guys are madly got to be spending on CapEx, do you want to own the guys who make the machines? 
So we hadn't talked about these stocks before. So this is ASML. So if you're gonna build a, uh, a new foundry, you're gonna have to buy a lot of equipment from ASM, ASA, AS, ASML. So this is a very popular stock on that basis, but you can see it's gone up a lot. Uh, applied materials has come down a little bit, but it's the same idea, right? You need, you need applied materials to make the chips and then LAM research as well. So you can see all of these have done extraordinarily well, um, you know, and it's blue sky ahead from them. It's just a question of whether it's already in the price. Okay, how about the chip shortage? Um, you know, here's just a slide saying that, uh, that the chip shortage should, should uh, you, know, ha you know, is gonna last for quite a bit longer. And uh, you know, before I pointed out that the if you're talking about auto chips, the purest way to invest in it is NXP semiconductors because NXP is a just you know sells a very high percentage of its product to the auto industry. So if you imagine it's just running full bore, trying to make as you know, it's trying to deliver chips to as many of its customers as it can. Okay. We're switching subjects again. We're still in tech, but you know this is you know we talked a little bit about this last time. This is Apple. Uh, this is sort of everybody's favorite stock. It's trading at 36.5 times. That's way too expensive for Apple, but that's somewhat related to the pandemic. So you're going to have a big improvement this year, which should take it down to about 26 times. Uh, that's not so bad. 26 times at 6% 6 per, 6 growth going forward. That's expensive, but if you like Apple, it's not egregiously expensive. So it's something you can think about at today's level. It's, it's probably not something uh, that's going to get you rich. Why should Apple trade now at a higher PE that it traded before when it was a lot smaller and had more growth potential? Well, we've shown this slide before, but we'll just repeat it. It's basically, it has the Hotel California thing going for it, that once people get used to these Apple products, your Apple phone, your iPad, your, your Apple Watch, you know, they don't want to switch to other brands. You have the razor and blade model where you buy one Apple product, and that means you're going to have to continue to buy another Apple product. So if you have an Apple phone, you're going to use Apple mobile and you have the subscription model, which everyone loves with some of their products that you're continually paying fees to Apple and recurring income. And all those things justify a higher multiple. Uh, the other question that Tony got last time we had the presentation was about uh, Apple and self-driving cars. You can see Apple is spending real money. I mean, it's got to spend a billion dollars a year uh, working on autonomous vehicles. But you can see this is a very crowded uh, uh, field with a lot of companies spending money on it. So it's got to be very difficult, you know. So, you know, Tony's view was that the whole car project wasn't necessarily a positive for Apple. Um, now we go to some of the other tech companies. Uh, you know, uh, I like quoting from Scott Galloway, who's a professor at the Stern School of Management in New York. Uh, you know, Scott, you know, he obviously makes the argument that just like in China, you know, where the Chinese government had to impose some new regulations and uh, threaten at least to break up some of the big tech companies there, the U.S. is facing the same thing. Uh, in China, you know, like when you hear that they were talking about big tech being too powerful, you know, I, I don't think the issue was as much political power as market power, right? And that's the exact same situation in the U.S. and has to be addressed in the U.S. So Scott Galloway thinks that that big tech will have a day of reckoning. Uh, when he wrote this, he said this year, it doesn't look like it's going to happen this year, but maybe next. Um, you know, and one of the things he said was it sounds bad, but he said, like, in case of Amazon, it's just set up very nicely to be broken up. 
because it can sell off Amazon Web Services and it could also spin off, um, well, it can't sell off, it's too valuable, but it could spin off Amazon Web Services and it could also spin off its uh, a logistics business. And why would it want to do that? Well, obviously, Amazon Web Services was able to grow and gain expertise and do all kinds of scale because it had Amazon as a gigantic client but it already has Amazon as a client and wants new clients. And some of the new clients compete with Amazon and they may not wanna use AWS for their cloud services. So it sort of frees up AWS to grow more if it's spun off. So the irony is if, if uh, Amazon is broken up, it'll probably just make Jeff Bezos richer. And in fact, he might decide to do it preemptively before the regulators can even try to ask him to do it. Um, uh, in terms of Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook also will probably benefit from breaking up because Facebook owns things like WhatsApp, basically to keep other people from owning it and then using it to scale up and create a super app that can compete with Facebook. So. WhatsApp really doesn't make much money or any money at all for Facebook, yet it owns it. So if it was forced to spin it off, it would create value. It would make Mark Zuckerberg richer. And the same thing can be said for a lesser expense sent with uh, Alphabet, you know, where, it, uh, you know, that uh, it has also things that it doesn't really make a lot of money from that it keeps just to be part of its ecosystem. Uh, you know this this chart here. I just these some add-on facts that you you know in, before Congress you had a lot of criticism of uh, of Facebook and Twitter about political bias. How did they decide what they allow on the site? How do they decide what they don't allow? How do they decide to ban Trump? Uh, yet Google has YouTube and is making a lot of the same decisions. Yet it really hasn't had that sort of criticism. Uh, and YouTube stock, of course, has done very well this year. If we're going through the fangs, the one fang stock that I'm always uh, wrong about is Netflix. I would have thought that with uh, Disney offering streaming and uh, Warner offering streaming and all these streamings that that would put some pressure on Netflix. But really what it did, it, it just encourages people to cut the cord and get rid of their cable television. And so they're encouraged even more to have Netflix. But the uh, looking at these platforms, one of the point of the chart on the left is to show just about all of them became more expensive this year than last year. Uh, finally, since I quoted from Scott Gall Galloway a lot, uh, I just wanted to, you know, put the link into things so you can find it yourself. I think you'll find them very entertaining. Um, if you, you might have flashbacks to a very, you know, for, to your own university education. He does not come across like you'd be a very nice professor, but he is very entertaining to watch his YouTubes. Uh, Scott Galloway, one of his favorite stocks, even before it IPO'd, was Roblox. We've never talked that about before. This goes back to my theme. If you want to have some allocation to these crazy expensive stocks, you can just buy a little bit of the ARC fund, Kathy Woods, and have exposure that way, or you could choose one you like. If Scott Galloway was choosing for you, he would choose Roblox because it's a it's a uh, company that tries to be positive. And as you can see, it has enormous market share of the time of American children, right? I mean, look at how many out minutes a day, right, that, that American kids spend on Roblox. It's ridiculous. This is actually, I have to rethink that, but I think that is a day, yes. Um, uh, here's another, uh, it, so here's another Scott Galloway uh, uh, favorite, and that is Airbnb. Uh, and basically as a simple logic, this is, he said, when, if you're looking at the, this is another very expensive stock, but if you're looking for an opening trade when people can travel again, 
He thinks people will be staying at Airbnb uh, and he has, and uh, so on that idea of opening trade on the last presentation, I explained why I didn't like the airlines. And I, and, and I kind of went through and said, they're not cheap. They, you know, their share price misleads you because they've issued a lot of new shares and they've issued a lot of debt. And at least it's nice to have been uh, correct on that. You can see since last month, the airlines have done badly with the exception of Southwest. The other uh, industry, which I didn't make a slide for that I've been talking about that I've been bearish has been the, you know, the, the high flying EV companies and some of the uh, 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 Western listed uh, uh uh, electric, solar, wind companies, uh, those two have uh, sort of declined at any those high flyers in that sector. So I kind of had called that a bubble. I called it a bubble pretty early, uh, but it's those things are going down enough that, uh, you know, I can feel like I was correct to call it a bubble. Okay, the, this, this is sort of an add-on here at the end because we, Tony and I always get these questions about marijuana. Uh, marijuana is going to be, uh, stocks are going to be a little bit in the news because uh, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, passed a bill with uh, pretty good support that, that basically allows banks, you know, basically says U.S. banks don't have to worry if they're dealing with a company involved in cannabis. So that's, uh, that doesn't solve all the problems for the U.S. marijuana industry, but that was one of the problems solved. And uh, will that bill get passed by the Senate? It does look like it has some bipartisan support, so it may get passed by the Senate as well. But anyhow, what Tony said at uh, one of our early sessions is these marijuana stocks are not for investing, they're for trading, they're sort of a momentum trade. Uh, he pointed out uh, that there aren't many companies that grow things like farm things that become very big. It's not a model that, that, that scales to become a big market cap company. And also the companies that these ETFs invest in are, are Canadian listed and they're because they can do they can operate up there because it is legal in Canada but that he thought if it was completely legal in the US, you'd have other big US companies get involved and it could become very competitive and the US companies could push the Canadian companies out. So having said that, here's the chart. You can see we had a blow off top and the uh, marijuana stocks are corrected. If marijuana is for trading, that sounds really weird to say that. If the ETF is for trading, uh, you probably don't wanna own it right now. Um, let's keep going. Uh, this is the last topic here, which is SPACs. Just to remind you guys, it's kind of counterintuitive, but there's an IP, there's an ETF that invests in IPOs, ticker IPO. There's an ETF that invests in SPACs, ticker SPACs. With SPACs, they can invest in the SPACs after they're listed, before they merge and join up with a target, and they typically own it from when it's a SPAC through the merger and then through the after the merger is complete and they hold on to the merge company for a while. That's how that ETF works. The IPO company obviously can't buy the stocks upon the EP, ET, IPO. So they buy recent ETOs and uh, recent IPOs and they hold them in the ETF. So as you can see, uh, SPACs and ETFs were making people a lot of money and they're in the process of coming back down to earth. So SPACs are certainly in the news here. We got, uh, so I've circled the two big ones, but the thing that'll surprise you here is that there's 16 US listed SPACs looking to merge with Asian companies. And I circled uh, Bridgetown and Altimeter because those are the two that are most in the news. We're gonna look at them a little bit more. And I'll say that uh, there even has already been one. There's a stock, a, a SPAC not on this list called Triteras, which is uh, merged with a Singapore fintech company and is down like 50%. And there's all kinds of lawsuits about the manager uh, doing the wrong thing and stuff. So at least the first 
uh, SPAC to take over a Singapore company. It didn't work out so well, but maybe Grab will be a better result. So before we get into that, let, I'll just kind of remind you kind of the way that, that these SPACs work. So this is a really good chart. I, so if you've kind of been like making yourself a cup of tea or something, get back to your computer and take a look at it. Because this, I used uh, Utz potato chips as my example of the good SPAC working the way it's supposed to. So basically this company Collier launches at a, a SPAC. So the SPAC was called Collier Creek Holdings. The Collier guys were well known at being good investors in the food business. They had it, uh, put together a company called Pinnacle Food, which owned a beloved uh, a pickle company and several other companies in the United States, Flasic Pickles, and they sold Pinnacle Food ultimately to ConAgra for a big price. So these guys have a good track record. They're gonna invest in food again. And you can see the IPO of the SPAC was at $10. It traded around $10 most of the time. And then after many months, they announced that they were gonna do a merger with Utz, with this uh, potato chip company. And it's a not a national potato chip company. It's extremely strong in Maryland, Pennsylvania. It, it's it's somewhat in New Jersey, obviously, uh, and somewhat in New York. So it's a so actually in terms of the stock market, that's a good thing because the people that people it, you know that's the region where people work on the stock market. Uh, so once it it named it was merging with UTS, people knew what UTS was, and the stock took a nice jump. But at that point, the merger hasn't gone through. It's just an announced deal that they've agreed to terms. So another bunch of months passed, and then the merger is complete. Collier Creek Holdings, which had been trading under the ticker, I can't remember what it was, changes its name to UTS, begins trading at UTZ, and then the stock just goes up because people decide they love potato chips. So that's the typical thing. Now we'll take a look at Altimeter and Bridgetone. Um, you know, I'm not gonna get too into the weeds here, but Altimeter, once again, you have a manager with a well-known track record. He had been an investor in uh, Snow, uh, Snowflake, the, uh, uh, the software company, which of course is a, a, you know, a, a big success. And he was also an investor in uh, Roblox. So he has a track record and Bridgetown, Bridgetown Holdings is Peter Thiel and Richard Lee, that's Lee Kaohsiung's son. So once again, these guys have track records, right? Um, and this is, of course, I, I'm, Grab is now has announced it's gonna merge with Altimeter. So Singapore is really on the map because that's the biggest SPAC deal ever. So just, I figured I'd give you a little bit of the history here. So Grab had, issued, had raised about 10 billion previously, and they're gonna raise another $4.5 billion through the merger in the SPAC. Now the SPAC only has 500 uh, million in it now. So Altimeter is gonna pony in another 750, and they said they're not gonna sell any of their shares for three years. Then they're going to raise another 3.2 billion from PIPE investors. PIPE stands for Private Investment into Public Equity. Okay, so, so that's going to be the big catch. And the result will be that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the, mer the merged company will have a lot of cash to fund Grab, which currently right now does not generate cash, it burns cash and has a lot of uh, areas where it wants to continue and expand. So Grab becomes listed, it does it at a high valuation and it gets a lot of cash in the bank. Um, then I just wanted to go in here at the last presentation, Ray said that he was investing in SPACs but uh, I wanted to clarify that that doesn't mean Ray is actually buying SPACs like us. He's buying into the investing in the managers of SPACs and he's investing in the kind of people who get to do the stuff like 
on this slide be the pipe investors in the SPACs, which are coming in at lower prices and better terms than if you just buy the SPAC on the exchange. So in the old George Carlin uh, line is, you know, it's a big club, but you ain't in it. So if you're investing in SPACs, there's a lot of sharp manager types who make a lot of money. But if you just madly buy the SPACs, you're not necessarily going to do well. Uh, so here's the history of Altimeter. I'll just keep it moving and say, you know, that that because the manager was thought to be good, uh, the SPAC is kind of traded at a premium to its $10 IPO price. And then after it did announce the merger with Grab, it went up. And here's Bridgetown, which was supposed to do the deal with Tokopedia and Gojek, which now it's in talks with Traveloka. And if you can see this one, it's it's still, you know, apparently the, you know, SPACs are no longer in vogue in the US. People aren't familiar with Traveloka. So the SPAC is trading pretty close to its IPO level right now after the deal was announced. Um, so Grab and Traveloka, um, you know, basically I've kind of already said Grab gets a good deal. It's raising its valuation for the merger is 40 billion. But if you look at April 20th price for Grab, uh, that values it at, you know, if you look at what price that the uh, SPAC is trading at, that, that means SPAC is valued at 52 billion, which means a grab at uh, 22 times sales for grab, which makes it very, very expensive. Uh, you know, and it also, if you if you kind of compare it to Uber, Uber only has a market cap of 108 billion. So they're saying grab is worth half the value of Uber. Um, grab is, I've already said grab is currently generating losses. Um, uh, whereas, and also on Bridgetone, since it's close to the IPO price, if you just have some great faith in Peter Thiel and Richard Lee, you know, you can, pro you can kind of safely buy that one because generally these things don't drop below the IPO price by very much. So when safely, I don't mean safe, safe. I mean, you're not going to lose that at least over the short term, you're not going to see the thing probably trade much below $10. But uh, in terms of grab, you know, is you know, it does seem like it's being well received by the market in the U.S. But if that changes, you just have to monitor it. But you basically don't want to buy this thing unless the valuation gets back to the same level that you saw the smart people buy, 